everyone uh, thanks for joining okay. us for another uh, talk as part of the web talk series as um, under the title of imaginaries for a resilient and inclusive new world uh, so this is the third in the series uh, our first speaker was sheila jasonov followed by nilufar kok and our today's speaker is michael uh, before we start the talk uh, I'm sure all of you all are probably um, feeling the same thing that uh, we are facing here, we are feeling here. Uh, as the lockdown kind of is coming to a close, we've completed about four weeks and another two more weeks to go. So we've completed six weeks and two more weeks to go. And as a few things got relaxed to ensure the economy was going to start functioning, uh, it was such a tragedy to wake up yesterday morning uh, to hear about the Wysag gas leak and the Raigad gas leak, followed by the thermal power plant boiler blast. And this morning where we all woke up to an yet another tragic news of uh, the migrant workers killed on a railway track. So as businesses are going to restart, uh, maybe this is going to be the new norm of more tragedies, more dilutions of our laws. And we all know here in India that our governments are continuously pushing for the dilutions of the environmental laws, the dilutions of the Electricity Act, uh, labor laws are being reformed, and many more are in the pipeline. So will this become a new norm that we are going to get used to? And along with this, this new strategy of, you know, if we have to survive this pandemic, physical distancing is another thing that we are going to follow. And with physical distancing uh, and uh, with the new fashion, that we are all going to be adorning the different kinds of masks that I've already started seeing everywhere around. What will our new life be like? Uh, it, it is very scary. Uh, it is going to create a whole lot of distancing, not just in, just in terms of physical distancing, but also in terms of caste, class, religion, and vertical, horizontal, all kinds of distancing it will start. And it will, we are going to be transforming to a completely new way of uh, life. So in that context, I think we are very lucky to have um, Professor Michael Goldman with us, who's going to be addressing some of these issues. And uh, his title, the title for his talk today is The Sudden Collapse of the Global Economy. Should we mourn or celebrate? The deadly pandemic and lessons for a socially just and ecologically resi resilient future. Uh, the dangerous COVID-19 pandemic has revealed where the global economy has failed us. If the economy cannot supply basic essentials such as a living wage, ample food, reliable healthcare, housing, and safe public space in ways that also work to overcome the climate crisis, then what is the current engine of the economy good for? The global economy and its innovative captains of industry have disappeared at a time we need massive social support. Do we really need them to return? This and more will be addressed uh, in his talk. And to those of us who don't know Professor Goldman, uh, Professor Goldman conducts research on questions of urban transformation, finance capital and development and eco-social justice. His first book, privatizing nature, focused on struggles over nature and the commons. His second book, Imperial Nature, 
on the World Bank and its expanding agenda of green neoliberalism. And his next book is on the making of Bangalore into a global city and its connect interconnections to increased urban volatilities worldwide. His articles have been published widely on ideas of speculative urbanism, dispossession by financialization, eco-governmentality and green neoliberalism. Goldman teaches at the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities in Sociology and Global Studies, is adjunct professor at National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore, was the VKRV Rao chair at the Institute for Social and Economic Change, Bangalore, from 2016 to 18, and is co-editor of a new book series at Cornell University Press called Land New Perspectives on Territory, Development and Environment. I think it's amazing that he's here with us today to discuss these issues of what's to come and what kind of transformations the pandemic is going to leave uh, with all of us. So as a format, before I hand over to uh, Michael, let's all keep our cell phones on mute and our microphones on mute. Uh, we would request all of you to type in your questions and comments to save time. And uh, Michael will speak for about 40 minutes, followed by question answers. Thank you, everyone, again, for joining us. And over to Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Bhargavi. And thank you, Leo. And thank you, everybody, for coming. I realize this is uh, 5 o'clock uh, PM in Bangalore, but please appreciate that this is 6.30 in the morning in uh, the United States. and. Uh, indulge me in the fact that my lips may get tangled and my mind might stop uh, because I normally don't utter a word for another three hours in the morning. But thank you for coming. Unfortunately, that which we all so desperately need, face-to-face -face human contact and warmth from collegial interaction will be missing today. But I do hope that we can imagine it with our collective energies today. So thank you for inviting me. ESG, and uh, I'm honored to be part of this uh, August lineup that you've set up for this series, and I hope it does go on for a long time, in person or online. Today, <clears throat> I will focus on this crazy moment to continue the discussion in this series and in the public on how to read the moment and how we, we can consider healthy and socially just ways out of it. I wanna start by highlighting and is my voice okay? Is this working fine? Yeah, we just need more light on your face though. Uh, I don't know if you want it. Okay. Um, so I want to start by highlighting that before this pandemic, remember those days, people were using the term crisis to refer to the dangerous and worsening effects of climate affecting every part of our dear but sick planet. Now with great fear and uncertainty and foreboding, we're talking about a global virus pandemic crisis, which too quickly our leaders and media have folded into talk of a third crisis, global economic crisis. So today I'd like to weave a narrative through these three crises to suggest how closely they're interlinked and how well we should be cognizant of all three at once when coming up with answers. Each one, I think, teaches us something about the other, and together they offer us a synergistic basket of analytics and alternatives that takes seriously the interrelatedness of the economic with public health, with the health of the planet. So to start, I'd like to describe how terrible the conditions are in the United States, where I live and am confined. Then secondly, more generally, I'll shift gears and describe some of the conditions that turned a viral infection into a global crisis, which relates directly to some key transformations that have occurred in the name of capitalism in the US, India, and globally. And finally, I'll return to a description of a change in politics and actions, which we can tra trace in the US, but of course thrive elsewhere as well, from which we can find hope and direction. These shifts may shine a, a path to a transformative politics in which we put in the center of our lives an economy that is subservient to the needs of society, our health and the planet, and not the other way around. So I'm not a philosopher and these examples do not come from my mind or from someone's game plan, but rather from existing and longstanding experiences, sentiments and actions. As some political activists say, we must first be able to imagine and picture the future 
we want in order to act upon it. And I see the future in the inspirational political demands of people across the world responding to these three crises. So to build upon the term of this talk series, resilience, I borrow a line from a doctor and an author, Siddhartha Mukherjee, who wrote, quote, efficiency at the cost of resilience is like a silent aneurysm waiting to rupture. And indeed, it has ruptured big time, especially in this adopted city of New York. I start with the virus and what it's teaching us about US infrastructure and the shrinking space of the public. New York City, the center of finance, the birth of hip hop, and so many cultural creations, and today so much wealth. Yet in spite of this amalgamation of talent and aspiration, there have been more than 20,000 deaths from COVID-19, about 220 a day on average the past three months, with recent days as high as 500 and still increasing. As our president wants everyone back in business now, these numbers will increase sharply to only kill many more people. So who's dying? Health workers, janitors, doctors, the elderly and the young, a disproportionate of which are people of color. In some places, two thirds are African American and new immigrants, even though they represent a relatively small fraction of the population. No, the virus does not affect everyone equally. It disproportionately kills those made vulnerable by our economy, and I'll flesh that out in a moment. Apropos to the wonderful talk last Friday by Nilifer Koch, the underlying condition of the nation state everywhere, she argued, is an insidious ethno-nationalism, such that the US head of state started off 2020 with no vision, no foresight, no hindsight, and completely denounced the existence of the pandemic. Then he blamed his opponents for fake news, then the media for asking tough questions like, where are the tests? Then attempting to name it the China, the Wuhan virus, then riled up his base of white supremacists to arm themselves and demand their freedom to shop and drop. Keeping in line with Koch's indictment of the nation state, our president demanded a ban on foreigners, closed borders, broke off relations with the EU and the WHO, and remained in complete denial that what was becoming revealed to all of us in the United States. Most basically, we failed to act upon the two public health lessons learned from Singapore, China, and South Korea, that is, the importance of testing and contact tracing, and instead exposed to all the world's largest all to the world that the world's largest economy, in fact, wears no clothes. We have no national public health system to call upon in a case of emergency, let alone on a daily basis. It is, in fact, the triumph of the U.S. style of aggressive, hyper-efficient capitalism. That is, let the market and the captains of capital shape our needs in society around its ambitions and goals. And let the government be reduced to an accommodating handmaiden. Remember, the political virus of free market neoliberalism started with Ronald Reagan in the 1970s, when he spoke for Wall Street by saying what became the most powerful rhetorical phrase in the late 20th century. He warned us to, quote, beware of the nine most terrifying words in history. That is, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. So when the pandemic hit our city's hospitals and our nursing homes, it elicited a, a blank stare. N95 masks, which cost 50 cents on the market, were absent. There were few personal protection equipments, PPEs in storage, ventilators were in short supply, tests were unreliable and expensive. It is May now, more than six months after the first signs of a pandemic, and there are few tests, most are unreliable. Many on the front lines are wearing homemade protective gear, washing and reusing against all public health directives. Our national security stockpiles ended up having enough equipment to supply New York City for 11 days. Many or most of the ventilators were broken or unusable. Our can-do macho president summoned the largest firms to his office and asked them to provide what's needed, and none responded. The car maker, GM, was asked to make ventilators in its closed auto plants, actually in a state which is pivotal for the upcoming elections. They took two weeks to negotiate, demanding an extraordinarily high profit rate to produce them, typical of corporations needing to provide high profits every quarter of the year. But in a national crisis, had the president said yes to that deal, the man who claims to know the art of the deal would have looked about six inches tall. 
so no ventilators. Today, we have major hospital chains that make their high profits from elective surgery that are now empty, while emergency and ICU wards are bursting at the seams. The highest percentage of COVID victims are, in fact, health workers who work night and day to save lives, but also, remarkably, they're also one of the highest categories of people put out of work from the virus. Those who work in private hospitals on elective surgeries. So let's unpack this paradox for a moment. Hospitals are filled with equipment worth billions of dollars, and we cannot have find enough 50 cent masks to save the lives of health workers. I doubt even the writers of a pandemic thriller novel could have imagined this. Surgeons and nurses are performing intubations and bronchoscopias in which viral particles shoot out airborne, splashing their faces, and they're left with no defense but handmade masks out of hockey equipment and plastic discarded in the trash. As Mukherjee vividly concludes from this tragedy, quote, the medical infrastructure of one of the wealthiest nations fell apart like a slapdash house put up by one of the three little pigs. <laughs> Why? Well, look at the, and then one example can shine some light on the structural problems of healthcare and then the larger condition of capitalism in America and beyond. A small company in the Midwest manufactured N95 masks for years, supplying major hospitals in the region. But its price was undercut a few years ago by a giant firm, Kimberly Clark, that outsourced the work to China and negotiated large contracts like only a monopoly could with hospital chains representing hundreds of thousands of, of hospitals, also monopolies. The market dried up for the small mask company, and like many local craftspeople and small producers of essential goods, they were put out of business. They were designated as the slack or waste in the economy by large investors steering monopoly firms. When China was forced to close down due to the coronavirus, US hospital chains immediately suffered from shortages and did not have the wherewithal, or perhaps the desire or necessity, to find alternative suppliers. The same is true of the basic, simple, inexpensive supplies that are required for widespread testing of the virus. The makers of the simple cotton swabs to grab the specimens from our noses, the small glass vials to transport the sample, the supply of reagents to process the test, and so on. The whole global supply chain collapsed in a heartbeat or perhaps a collective cough. Months before the pandemic hit, hospital staff were already panicking because of a shortage of basic IV fluid for their patients. Both the sterile saline solution and the plastic bags they sat in, as they are made in a single factory in Puerto Rico, which was devastated by Hurricane Maria. Hurricanes are becoming more deadly and more frequent due to climate crisis and IV fluids are becoming more necessary because of such reoccurring climate-related catastrophes. Even though the word resilience comes up all the time in World Bank policy, it is, it is busy incorporating the same corporate business model in its lending and support around the world, using this hyper-efficiency business model as a precondition for development loans. And global monopolies financed by Wall Street firms create quote-unquote efficient global supply chains using cheapened labor, cheapened inputs, producing cheapened in goods for consumption while producing the expensive waste and the greenhouse gases that are fueling planetary destruction. This is the other pandemic going viral around the world, this cutthroat business model. It has become a catalyst for our current virus, climate and social crises today. Meanwhile, our global food systems are also run in a way not so dissimilar to our healthcare systems. Hyper-efficiency, monopolies, just-in-time production, with absolutely no slack, as they call it at business schools. No slack in the system. As they once used to say about animal slaughterhouses in Chicago, we cut up, package, and sell everything but the pigs squeal. In the case of food, smooth, efficient, maximum profit with no waste. Slack is the evil of this global business model. And slack is when someone gets sick, when a factory gets flooded, when electricity goes out, when a zoonosis virus spreads from wild animals to humans who are working day and night in a meat slaughterhouse, preparing meats to be shipped around the world, and they fall sick or they die. Slack is when a shipping sector no longer is needed and its highly subsidized fossil fuel industry 
is no longer purchased. So the price on the futures market of oil drops to negative $36 a barrel, as it did a few weeks ago. And so the president of the United States begins to threaten military attack on Iran or whomever he can find to blame. There's, no ap there's absolutely no slack in the global supply chain for food. So when there is a glitch or a pause or a virus, there's quickly disaster on a global scale. This is the polar opposite of resilience. To call this resilient is to call war peace. As we can see, this system's not built on efficiency, it's built on huge government subsidies and political muscle. How else can the Midwest of the United States be a major supplier of meat to China, slaughtering 700,000 pigs a week? And yet in this crisis, the producers are euthanizing tens of thousands of animals a day due to the breakdown of the supply chains. The largest of these US plants not far from my house, owned by a Hong Kong-based firm. While on the other side of our fragile planet, China is a major exporter of chicken to fast food stores in the United States and beyond. The only way a cheap factory meat can cross the seas and provide the basis for a $1 fast food sandwich, which is profitable for McDonald's, is if the fossil fuels and the chemicals and the shipping sectors are highly subsidized by governments with Himalayan sized tax breaks and gifts so that global corporate giants can survive and profit. So in February and March, when the slaughterhouses in China were closed down due to COVID virus spreading, the slaughterhouses in the Midwest here increased production to pick up the slack. These have now become the most dangerous sites for COVID illness and death in the United States, in part because of the design of the assembly line of slaughter, the length of the carcass and the ways in which labor output is maximized by keeping workers close to the line and close to the carcass. Slaughterhouses are where undocumented immigrants and the working poor work in below living wages night and day. Because the workers have gotten sick from the virus, they can no longer work. And because the main clients of these large producers and distributors of food are restaurants, fast food joints, universities, office buildings, schools, all of which have been shuttered to slow the virus, Animals are killed and disposed of en masse. Workers are sent home without pay or health support. And remarkably, our food stores shelves are empty of meat, eggs, milk, and vegetables. Our giant food store chains are actually rationing meat to customers. By contrast, if you go to our local cooperative food store, since they get their food from local and regional farmers, their shelves are full. But since the state does not support local production, local farmers, nor local cooperatives, that food is quite expensive. Once the slaughterhouse workers got sick en masse in the United States, and clients such as the school systems and fast food chains shut down, the food rots. There's no slack in this business model for adaptation, improvisation, exceptions, or crisis. The milk and the eggs are destroyed so that the business model thrives. The government bails out these large firms during the stoppage, even though 40 to 60 million Americans are relying on charitable food banks right now. What we learn is our business model requires the food to be destroyed, just like the Bengali famine under British colonialism. One can imagine a government that required firms to produce based on people's needs and nature's limits, especially during a crisis. But that's clearly another world. In this world, this is state-of-the-art capitalism at work. And at work it is. Although 90% of the US economy has completely stopped and corporations have been unwilling to shift gears and produce something for the good of society, masks, saline solution, food, housing, the stock market in April last month rose at a higher rate than any time since 1987. According to the Wall Street Journal, billionaires are making more money today than in than in the past 25 years. The most lucrative sectors of the US economy are Wall Street, private equity, hedge firms, venture capitalist firms. These are the vultures, but they also set the norms. These have invested heavily in healthcare over the past few decades and even faster recently. As a nod to P. Saneth and his book, Everyone Loves a Good Drought, Wall Street loves a good pandemic, especially those that manage life and death. They're the ones who profit handsomely. 
The number of private equity deals in healthcare in one year alone, 2018, reached 800 in the US for a total value of $100 billion. One company, KKR, which, you, which is quite, um, which invests heavily in India right now, making ha money hand over fist, swooping up depressed assets like candy spilled on the floor across India, spent $10 billion purchasing one healthcare uh, chain called Envision. It operates hundreds of surgery centers across the country and leveraged the deal by, cr by creating $4 billion worth of debt loaded up on that company, which then forced the company to cut, create efficiencies and eliminate slack. To accelerate this process across the industry, mergers and acquisitions in the past five years have skyrocketed in healthcare. The business model to create debt onto the purchase company, then cut waste and obliterate the care in healthcare. These deals lead to massive job loss, closures of hospitals in rural areas and those serving the working class, and speed up work of those remaining that mostly serve the middle and upper classes. Slack is their enemy. Every space in emergency rooms, extra space in emergency rooms and ICUs, storage of masks and ventilators, those create wasteful losses for their shareholders. Over the past decade, private equity firms such as Carlisle, also big in India, have bought up uh, almost 2,000 nursing homes for the elderly. In fact, 70% of nursing homes uh, for the elderly are owned today in the U.S. by private equity firms. And this is a global plan. They have cut staff, supplies, killed off competitors, and increased their prices. But most remarkably, today, one-fourth of all COVID-19 deaths in the United States are in these nursing homes. Most workers who speak to the press say how they have little access to protective equipment, the nursing homes are overcrowded, ill-equipped, and that they, in order to pay their bills, work in more than one nursing home during the week, having to work more than 40 to 60 hours just to live. Those who speak out are typically fired. Not only are health workers in general the most likely to get sick, they're also the most likely to become unemployed. That is, hospitals are part of, a na of national chains, many of which are owned by Wall Street, make their money through expensive electric surgery, like knee, hip, organ replacements. Those expensive procedures are typically played by insurance companies and the vulnerable underinsured. What we see starkly from the pandemic is that healthcare, like the food system, are two-tiered. In healthcare, the emergency rooms and the ICUs and the public and university hospitals are overwhelmed with patients, sickness, death, without sufficient protective gear, or IV fluids. On the other side, we have hospital wings that today are completely shut. Healthcare workers laid off and unemployed because these businesses are no longer profitable to run during a health crisis. Many of the more than 5,000 outpatient surgery centers have closed. Uh, one doctor decried in the press uh, recently, half of the surgery centers in New York are not doing anything. And all the anesthesiologists and the nurses who are sitting on the sidelines, they want to help. They don't know how to help. There's nowhere for them to help. That is, we have a healthcare system completely mystified by the needs of the public, completely ill-prepared to cure, to care, and with a business model that won't allow for care, and a public that has been forced into helplessness. The brutal nature of our healthcare system is, is that when a crisis hits, mortality will be a natural and expected consequence. As workers fall sick and unemployed, key segments of capitalism are celebrating. Their CEOs feasting like gluttons, in a period where 60 million people have become unemployed in the United States, when one in five children go hungry. After a deep fall in the stock market in February, the, the stock market in April rose. One hedge fund parked itself in the luxurious and empty Four Seasons Hotel, right in the midst of the worst deadly uh, hotspot in the US, that is New York, and made last month an annualized 13,000% rate of profit. Disaster capitalism is the business of Wall Street, and right now it's a veritable feeding frenzy. Okay, take a deep breath. We're gonna switch gears to the sunny side of the story. <laughs> Part two, reinventing the public and killing the virus of this business model. So let us not forget that even before the pandemic, the United States was alive and well with protest movements pushing for structural change. 
First thing in office, our president gave immediately a $2 trillion tax break to large corporations and the rich. So it's really not that heroic that the US Congress today is offering $3 trillion as a bailout to the rest of society to keep the population alive while business rests, waits to reopen. Since he took office, there have been a string of potent school, school teacher strikes and walkouts demanding a living wage, in-class supports for our children, and actually strong and conservative states where unions are all but forbidden. In many cities across the country, after strikes and protests, city workers have won a $15 an hour minimum wage across the city. Another powerful movement has been the protest and blocking of the fracking-based Dakota Access Pipeline, which brought together indigenous, green, and justice activists from all over the world to participate in a campaign that was equally about climate crisis, ending fossil fuel use, protecting our rivers and ecosystems, indigenous rights, water quality, and pushing for a new green and socially just economy. There's also the youthful sunrise movement run by high school and college kids, joining others across the world, walking out every Friday, supporting climate change politicians, and supporting the versions of the Green New Deal, a plan to spend trillions of dollars to eliminate fossil fuels and rebuild the economy based on the needs of the planet, but to do so in a way that, that works to overcome the structural inequalities that keeps people so poor and a handful so rich. Radical ideas that actually today in the pandemic don't seem so radical, but actually logical seen in this new light. When we talk about trillions of dollars for the Green New Deal, that's how much uh, is, it was distributed in a flash by Congress just to ensure that workers don't starve before businesses open up. So all of a sudden the idea of spending does not sound so outrageous. The argument is stop subsidizing fossil fuels in the shipping sector and let us instead use that money to support the economy for people's needs. It's funny that the presidential candidate, Bernie Sanders, sounded so radical just a few years ago. And today Congress is enacting semblances of that radical politics during this crisis. A universal wage, paid sick leave for workers, paid leave to help a family member, money to not work, and many cities and states are enacting a moratorium on rent and a moratorium on mortgage payments and free testing for all. All of this is because of movements that have existed for years, but it's, it, it really comes up as a sharp contrast and becomes so commonplace now to talk about these as rational moves after the crisis. One place where people are most vulnerable, actually, from coronavirus are prisons. And we have the largest prison system in the world and, and in terms of the uh, ratio per population, the largest in the world. Recent, remarkably though, even in the most conservative states in the US, governors are releasing small numbers of prisoners. So prisons don't become mass graves on their watch. The prison abolition movement and Black Lives Matters have been organizing tireless, tirelessly for years without hardly any press coverage. Now it's become common sense. Advocates for homeless and for tenant rights, renters' rights, are succeeding in getting cities and states to stop home evictions and push for rent moratoriums. Mutual aid societies, mutual aid societies are popping up. We help you, you help us. And the, the dream of anarchists all over is now being taken up by people in neighborhoods where job loss and precarity has become common. These are all organic movements working across the country on multiple levels, engaging in serious conversations with state and local and community level politics to bring about a cascade of changes that have started at the bottom, not at the top. Some cities such as mine, Minneapolis, are actually paying empty hotels to house the homeless, which is certainly a temporary and somewhat bizarre move, right? But one that opens up the question of the city's responsibility to the public for humane housing for all. My state has 80,000 empty hotel rooms, 20,000 homeless. Do the math. City employees have calculated it's cheaper to house them in hotels than take care of them when they contract the coronavirus. But only because homeless advocates have demanded it, it's not because the math is good that it's happened. There's a homeless advocacy group in New York City called Picture the Homeless. Tired of being told the city has no room for them, 
police constantly harassing them to get out, conducted a research study and found the city has 3,500 vacant buildings, 2,500 vacant lots, all staying intentionally empty for speculation, some of which have been sitting idle for years, all of which could house up to 200,000 people. There are 80,000 homeless people on the streets in New York City today, and that does not count the people living in their cars or people uh, living on someone's couch, waiting for a place to live. The city owns 10% of that vacant property. The city alone could house its people, but only under pressure to decommodify the housing market for those who can't afford it. And that's precisely what activists are asking for and city mayors are talking about today. Activists are presenting the plan of housing cooperatives linked to nearby farming co co uh, cooperatives, producing food, community health clinics, offering free services on site, anchored by what are being called community schools. Uh, with educators realizing that education is just a small fraction of what our public schools actually provide to the community, some quote unquote failing schools in big cities have been redesigned already to offer not just classes for kids, but also support for the kids' future by offering health care for the whole community, not just the individual, mental health care, free healthy breakfast and free lunch. That is, it has become a nodal point for help and care in the community. That's how schools are being redesigned, at least in this experiment. Now, of course, all schools are shuttered. We realize how much resources they provide. More than science and spelling, they provide health care, before and after school care, while parents work overtime. The idea of a community school serving the whole community is catching on. Funny thing is, it's precisely what the revolutionary movement, the Black Panthers called for in the 1970s and set up in poor black neighborhoods. Most of them, however, were shot or imprisoned for these radical ideas. Now some cities see community schools as the best way to replace the economy of austerity and punishment with the economy of care. Intentional communities, cooperative movements, and connecting with local producers and craftspeople cultivate these relational dynamics focused on producing and caring and giving and meeting people's needs. But at the same time, we need to move beyond the local, of course, in acknowledging the global nature of the COVID-19 crisis, the global nature of climate crisis, the workings of global capitalism that pit one locality against another locality. locality. We need to intentionally delink from the business model of finance capital, delink from the fossil fuel industry and global supply chains that see community efforts as slack and waste. I'm gonna conclude now so that we can get into a discussion. The checklist for alternatives I just presented are part of an ongoing public discourse and of people's imaginations, trying to figure out ways out of this scary crisis especially knowing how our federal government and our corporations have failed us during this crisis. I do know that although conservatives in our country who hate government and demonize handouts to poor people are now, are now offering a living wage for paid for healthcare and are doing so just during this pandemic and will surely retreat to the politics of austerity as soon as it's over, especially after the elections in November. I'm not naive, but now that everyone is in shock and these ideas have been let out of the bottle and they just might become infectious. In Europe, there are movements calling for degrowth or a shift into a caring society that would work to stop climate crime crisis by making the economy subservient to our essential needs and kick the habit of growth for growth's sake or growth for the bottom line for shareholders. We need homes we can afford not to speculate upon. We need healthcare for all and streets on which we can walk and bike. We know that as a society, we're teetering on a precipice. The planet is on a ventilator and we're all waiting for the next shoe to drop or the oxygen to run out. It is so obviously time for a change. This pandemic has forced open the discussion about the underlying conditions of the capitalist business pandemic and how deeply injurious it is to our health and to the planet. 
People are more than labor and the environment is more than a factory input or a waste bin. The zoonotic viruses will only get worse and spread faster unless we stop killing off wildlife habitat, converting animals into factory inputs, using subsidized toxic fuels to move goods and people endlessly around the world, solely to produce and sell the cheapest good to the indebted customer. The, the system has no slack and it has no heart. It's run by the top 1% for their benefit, and yet we allow it to thrive. And as such, we are deeply complicit. So the question is, how can we quickly shift gears, join hands, and build up a localized forms of power to serve the needs of people around us as a way to spare the suffering of others and the ecosystems elsewhere? We need to say no to ethno-nationalisms of all stripes and abandon borders and detention camps and prisons and instead turn to what has become the common sense of producing at our most innovative ways, good food, good health care, fossil free energy, based on a caring society to which a new subservient caring economy will serve. The climate crisis and the global pandemic give us no other choice. But we need to be sure our sense of jo social justice and equity shapes the path forward, as so many of our essential workers are showing us already. All relevant knowledge is within our grasp. We don't need McKinsey consultants to teach us justice. The key to change is really to establish on the ground what we need and build up an invigorated sense of society, global society, driven by these needs. As Irfan Khan, the actor, said so powerfully at the Handmade Conference two years ago, as highlighted on the ESG website, we are all craftspeople, we are all artisans. When we use our body, our hands, our heart, and our soul. He said most Muslims in India are in fact artisans and yet are poor. How beautiful would it be if our countries would see all of us as artisans, making value by hand and ensuring that we all have equal value. The better we tap into this sentiment he offered us, the better we will have the capacity to craft a world that sustains our needs and at the same time, one that overcomes existing injustices and inequalities. If so, we will be well on our way to saying good riddance to exploitation, dispossession, and ecological des devastation. The fact that our corporate leaders so quickly abandoned us and society as soon as the pandemic hits suggests where they stand and reminds us that we need to keep them on the sidelines of the future for the sake of our planet, for social health, and for social justice. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> so we already have a bunch of questions and to save time, we will start with the questions. So Das says, how good a model is Cuba for the future? Does it have a lot of the ingredients that you suggest for the world? Uh, thank you for the question. Yeah, um, I mean, I think it's important to, well, Cuba has a long history, right? But I wouldn't see Cuba as, an, as a singular nation state because then we put too much burden and responsibility on that nation state. It, it exists within an interstatal system. And of course, for decades, it's been denied access to global resources by the United States and others, right? So it, it's, it's, if you call the model of a caring economy, is not just part of that socialist ideal that, um, that existed in the late 1950s. It's also a reaction to global capitalism and the kind of militarism that has existed on its borders, right? So it's really important to appreciate that, that it's, it, that, the fact that it's, it's alive and surviving and that it, it shares its medical expertise with other countries throughout the world is really a remarkable um, accomplishment. But one can only imagine what Cuba would be like when it's integrated in the global society, which, where it's no longer hunted. So I, 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 you know, uh, the reason why I say it in, this, in these terms is because I, I'm, you know, I, I too, I'm impressed by what they've done with so little. 
And I think in that sense, it's a model. But we want to appreciate that we don't want to isolate people, right? Ethno-nationalism. We don't want to isolate people and starve them for them to then produce this kind of caring society. And of course, it, it has flaws, just like, um, you know, just like society. Um, but I think there is something to learn from Cuba. But I think there's something bigger to learn from the Cuba experience, which is that we, we, we can't attack populations like this. And that's part of, of course, the caring society. Thank you for the question. Did we freeze? Hello? Hi, are we working? My, my audio is giving up. I, my audio is giving up. I couldn't hear the last part of it. So uh, should I continue? I'm sorry if I stopped you in between. No, I don't know. I'm, I saw some heads moving, so maybe it was just yours. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, moving on, we have a question from uh, Prakash Kashwan. So Prakash says, uh, if, uh, Prakash is a fellow from the University of Connecticut, a social scientist. So he says, thanks for this insightful talk. It is a bit of a paradox to me that precisely at a time when the role of the state has become most urgent, most of your examples refer to anarchist movements slash neighborhood groups. It would be nice to hear your reflections on this. <laughs> yeah, good question. Well, uh, look, I'm not living in India right now. And, you know, what, what the um, top echelons of the Indian state did is just horrible and the way it has and will affect people is just horrendous. So the, the quote unquote lockdown in India looks very different than the shutdown in the United States. Um, I mean, people are suffering here, no question, but not in the, in the same brutal form that it happened in, in, in India. So that's just point number one. And so it's happening differently around the world, of course. Many states are in denial, right? I mean, like, my, like the United States, particularly, the uh, political arm of the United States, you know, like the president. Um, but I do think, and thanks for asking the question, that it is important. So every movement that I described is really a critique of the state, right? Every movement is coming, it's coming from cities. It's coming from the vitality of cities. That is, and, I, and I'm not trying to reify cities as opposed to a village, but, but the reality is, is the most um, innovative, politics that are emerging from the US today are particularly in places where people are trying to take control and have the ability to take control of city councils, uh, of school boards, you know, uh, and of course of, uh, of the mayor's position to enact things that are closer to people's needs locally. That is, um, you know, the right to a living wage is one of the most uh, powerful movements across uh, the United States. Why? Because it's totally unaffordable to live on a typical wage. So what's happening is this dynamic, it's, it's, it of course is a critique of the state at the central or federal level, but it's also the possibilities that exist on local level government. And so the most progressive changes that have happened in the last decade are not because of the central government. In fact, the opposite, right? Uh, the central government has been brutal on immigrants the local governments have created sanctuary cities, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the, po the possibility of transformation are really, of course, happening on the local level. It's, not, you know, I guess it's not the, the, the ideal form of anarchism because we're, we're appealing to city government. We're appealing, we're using neighborhood power to appeal to city government, to change the rules, to invoke the, these kind of rights at the level of the city. And, it's, and if we're lucky at the level of the state, um, so uh, it is that critique of the, the state, but it's really in a, a, a trying to take possession of the state to democratize the state. And you know, it's, it, intuitively it is anarchic, right? But it's not, a, it's not a, instead of the local state, the local government, because me, most people feel that there's a lot of power in taking over local government. Thank you. Uh, we have Saumya Datta. Uh, his question is, it's clear enough to us all that though SARS-CoV-2 caused the COVID-19 disease, the pandemic has been created 
uh, but our economic globalization, similar was the case in 1918 to 20 flu, or even the 1515 to 20 epidemic in the Aztecs, Latin America. Apart from localized localization movements, how do you see us all building a vaccine for economic globalization? Well, uh, if we think of the critique that you just offered and the one that I suggested rather quickly, um, you know, global capitalism, you know, cor large, large corporations, what have they been doing? They've been eating up the local, right? Like this, the example I gave of that small mask company. Uh, it's not that the U.S. is not able to produce small masks that, are, that save people's lives. Same in India, same in Thailand, same around the world, of course. The problem is part of the, the way in which corporations can profit is to eliminate competition. It's the antithesis of free market, right? It is the elimination of competition. It's the creation of monopolies, and it can only do it with the power of the state. So I think implicit in that critique is the acknowledgement that local economies thrive, that it's the local economies that are being attacked. That's the only way you can have something called global capitalism, right? Um, so I think that's what we need to take back. And so I would imagine, and I think quite effectively, that it's not that what we want to do in my community is to produce something that is, you know, digestible by, by a community where you live. No, but it's to find solidarity in sharing natural resources, in curbing our excess use of natural resources by, by keeping th things local and regional. It's the lessons that we can learn from each other that create that kind of global solidarity, rather than insistence that we must trade with each other in order to create global solidarity. That's the whole myth of globalization from the conservative, from the neoliberal, from the classical economic perspective. That the only way we can create global democracy is to trade with each other, right? And that was the argument of, of, of European colonialism, right? <laughs> Subjugate people, teach them how to trade with us, and then they become civilization, right? But we know that that's the opposite, true. So we don't need to create global solidarity through trade. What we need to do is create global solidarity through local and regional processes of action that are just and are green in terms of the concern of climate crisis, right? How's that? Thank you. Uh, Samia, do you want to respond to that? Can you see that in India? Uh, not right now. Uh, I, think, I think my question was how, how do we really develop a vaccine against economic globalization, not for more trade? Obviously, the global trade is the reason cause. Anyway, thanks. Well, I, I, you know, I wish we were all in a room together so I can just turn the question back to you. How do you think? How can you see around you, you know? Um, I mean, I, uh, where are you? Are you in Bangalore? I'm in Delhi. Oh, in Delhi. Okay. Periphery of Delhi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, can you see the sky? <laughs> yes, I can see the sky. Well, that's wonderful. So, I mean, that's, an, that's a goal, right? <laughs> Something as simple as to see the sky, you know, to breathe the air, to uh, make sure that the water is clean. And the only way to do that is to take control of the local economy, right? I mean, there's no other way. And to take control of the local economy, which means pushing out the power of those who are only interested in global, the global, right? I mean, just think about your real estate companies they, in, in Delhi. They only thrive because they borrow money from different parts of the world. And, they, and by borrowing that money, they're in debt. And the only way that they can get out of debt is to take farmland, figure out the way to take more land from the government, from politicians, from farmers, and speculate. Build luxury condominiums, not affordable housing. Why? Because they owe so much money, so many dollars, right? And now they're so far in debt that private equity, Wall Street, has come in to buy their debt, which just puts them further in debt and has now a piece of your real estate owned by a global capital firm that has no interest in housing people, right? So see how far, how quickly the housing market in Delhi has moved from your grasp. So the question is, how do you create local rules to say, for example, that housing can only be built by local producers for local uh, buyers and the people 
who build a house have to guarantee that within a two years it's lived in. I know it's impossible to imagine that because of the way power works, but that is a legitimate argument, right? That is a housing, not affordable housing, because affordable housing is some calculation by a mainstream economist that makes it completely uh, above the possibility of most people. And without housing, people can't live. And without housing, COVID virus is, gonna, is spreading like wildfire through your construction industry, through your garment industry, et cetera. So housing has to be a necessity. So that's just one example. The other example, of course, is food. The third example is healthcare. When I first uh, started to come to Bangalore more than 10 years ago, there were only a handful of ICU beds in Bangalore. Now there's just the same handful. Why? Because every new hospital is part of a global hospital chain. Most of those chains are mostly owned by sovereign wealth funds, Singapore, Abu Dhabi, and in New York. So there's gotta be a way to delink it, create local legislation that say that the next hospital has to provide you know, care for those who can't afford those hospitals. There has to be a way to, to take advantage of that kind of gross negligence on people's lives and, and turn it into regulation, to law. I know it's, it, it sounds difficult, but each one of those at a time can create these kind of concentric circles that expand outward. That is, once you start thinking about the healthcare system, you start thinking about housing, and you start thinking about food. When I first went to Bangalore just 10 years ago, they had the most incredible mango fields, coconut groves, spinach, cauliflower, dal, uh, you know, lentils, etc. Now they import it. And what stands in that place? Empty luxury buildings, right? These contradictions have to be dealt with on a local level. And hopefully the, the key is to make the, the locality, whether it's Delhi or Bangalore or a small town, so hostile to global capital, so hostile to speculation that no investor would wanna come there. That's the ideal. And what have we been doing? We've been bending our backs to make our places so hospitable, right? Giving up our wages just to produce tall buildings in the hopes that rich people will come, right? Even though those buildings are unaffordable to the people who build it. These contradictions, I think, become explicit and clear and scary during a pandemic. And I think these, you know, whichever issue that, that matters to you most is the issue that I think that you should, you should draw upon. You know, the limits of access to profit making for these essential goods. And I think aside from this pandemic, I think the global cr climate crisis makes it inevitable. It's getting hotter in Delhi, right? The, 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 the seas are rising in Jakarta. Miami will soon be underwater. You know, these are, these are the nature, nature's limits. And hopefully we can, as sick as it sounds, take advantage of that and use it to chase out these, these investors that are undermining our local capabilities. Thank you. Uh, we have Vicky and can I say something? Yeah, can I, I, I will give you a chance. Just a minute. We'll just take a couple of questions and then I, I saw your hand uh, go up. Just We'll just finish this question and get back to it. So Vijay says, uh, thank you, Dr. Goldman, for the vast canvas. Uh, his first question is, one of the key unfortunate commonalities between US and India now is the macho heads of our states. But one insisted on not shutting down to save the markets and another insisted on locking down. But as it turns around now, India has started to lift the lockdown in a week when we registered the maximum cases. To me, it appears like a clear case of the changing class characteristics of who was getting infected when at the time the lockdown started and who is getting infected now. Surely the disease has shifted its mass base to the working classes and the urban poor now. How do you look at this? Was Trump allowing everyone to die vis a vis Modi, who is clearly protecting the balcony class of India? <laughs> yeah, well, I think we should all be looking like this now, right? <laughs> I mean, we all have to, we all have to we all protect, protect ourselves, but also we have to figure out a way. What, I mean, uh, just what happened, what, two days ago? I mean, that horrific decision to, to deny the Bihar workers uh, free train rides back home after such a long time of suffering. 
I mean, that has to be a catalyst for rethinking your relationship with the center, you know, to the state and the local. Um, I mean, whatever it is, it's, it's just sort of these desperate moves. I mean, there's, there's no logic, there's no rationale. It's all about elections and it's all about, you know, money, unfortunately. The construction industry has to go on. It's important to appreciate the construction industry in India, which Modi said has to, you know, recommence, is so deep in debt to global capital that it'd probably be better and safer if they just stopped. <laughs> you know, building more is not gonna get them out of the problem. Otherwise, they would be, you know, there wouldn't be such a colossal debt and non-performing assets that are basically sinking your public banks. But instead of, uh, you know, being driven by that, by that scary desperation of trying to get out to, of debt by more growth, you need to realize that that relationship between debt and growth uh, are, are intimate. The more, you, the more you grow, the more the construction industry is going to fall deeper in debt, as are the people who are speculating on those apartments. We need to figure out a way to stop. So, yeah, I mean, I don't see much difference between, frankly, Modi or Trump, Erdogan, Putin. You know, the, this, is, this is a really a scary moment for uh, leadership. But... This is also an opportunity, you know, of course. I mean, I don't have a simple answer. What should have India done? But the, pro but the problem, of course, is that the workers are, are going to die, you know, in huge numbers. And whether the media has the guts or wherewithal to cover it, you have to cover it. You know, you have to organize and you have to decide that this is something that needs to be uh, changed. And, the, the, you know, just as there was a uh, universal income uh, for rural Pe uh, peasants or workers who are kicked out of work because of consolidation in your agro industry. So too, do you, you, you need some sort of action. You, you need a basic income for all those workers who are sitting in squalor in the cities and probably a free ticket back uh, home. The problem, of course, is back home, uh, people are deeply in debt. So there has to be, you know, sort of a, an Indian Jubilee moment where all debt is forgiven, right? And I don't mean debt to, uh, to your largest uh, developers, like, you know, DLF. I mean debt for the, the average person who will die uh, if they don't get a meal. So I think uh, we need to stop focusing on, or at least what movements have taught me and politics have taught me here is that how horrible our, our leader is, he can be isolated as he is. He looks six inches tall right now because he's incapable of doing anything but, but supplying uh, bailouts to his friends. So in the meantime, people are acting. And of course, um, everyone here is, you know, socially isolated or physically isolated. But the key is how to become socially involved, which I know is very difficult. But I think if you can come out of this pandemic, and it's not going to be easy, by delinking from the central government ideology and figuring out how to organize yourselves, you know, citywide, townwide, neighborhoodwide, communitywide. Um, and in, in, in your situation, in a sense, middle class people uh, have to really pivot towards the, the laboring classes because they represent the huge percent of the population and they will die. Uh, and there has to be a way to intervene. And, and, you know, there's two ways to intervene, right? One is, is to give, you know, to give a mask or some medicine or a meal. The other way is to intervene and through those social relations, try to figure out what people's needs really are. And in that way, creating a new kind of social dynamic, a new kind of politics based on their needs, right? Because what are their needs of those Bihari uh, construction workers? That's an open question. How much time do people actually spend trying to figure that out and figure out then how to get to, get to that? And from that, we build, right? Rather than it be a charitable move, it's a political move. And, and frankly, it's a, it's a public health move. So that's my thought. On that question. Thank you. Um, Jayalakshmi, would you like to now say? Jump in. But turn on your uh, mute. Thank you. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Goldman. Uh, I was in Bangalore about uh, eight years ago. And I was working with a bunch of youngsters for you know, uh, Panchalatna plus Deo Sardana and Bhargavi Rao. 
you're familiar with my with the kind of work we did and the kind of green activism that we did and that you know we tried to save a lake and you know uh, avoided them, uh, them from uh, cutting the bamboo trees because the bamboos uh, they are the uh, you know ones which um, sustain maximum amount of biodiversity and uh, <clears throat> my concern is that in this global pandemic the greatest suffering scary things that been communicated to them you know some right some wrong and you know they're getting a lot of confusing signals so i and i like what you said about this community concept self sustaining community concept where you know the large corporates because they don't swallow the smaller uh, the, you know providers you know they are still able to continue to uh, survive and this, this was also described by mahatma gandhi when he talked about swarajya where each that he talked of each village as a self sustaining unit so i do, i know it's not possible anymore because we as a world have become too interconnected but if we somehow could make you know each of our communities you know Uh, interdependable in terms of living in harmony with the surroundings biodiversity in you know retaining on their the natural resources for their food resources as well as other resources i mean how do we communicate this to them and more important um, is going to be difficult because the politics is not going to allow it because we faced a lot of flak and saldana and leo saldana a lot of others helped us a lot in our work so you have this, a this is my question that yeah i have got a question in there i hear a question in there okay. yeah no thanks i i, I really appreciate it i mean the, uh you know as you said it's not possible to have a self sustaining community ecosystem i think we and maybe even gandhi recognize that we're all related you know at, at different scales if you just think about the city of bangalore you know which is now 11 plus million people you can't create uh, a self sufficient community in one part of bangalore right whatever happens up at the, up at the airport in north bangalore northern part m- miles away from southern part or whitefield are completely interconnected it's one ecosystem right the more you 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 fill in the water catchment system you cut down the trees and you build uh you know industry and housing up in the north it has a direct effect on the lakes belandur and vartor in the south and the water that was once clean is now contaminated flows through the city a city of 11 million people that had its own water system right is now completely bankrupt and contaminated So whatever happens in one part of Bangalore or or in the region has a deep ecological and social effect on another part of Bangalore and I think we can scale up and say in terms of cities along the Kaveri river in terms of the, what's happening in 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 the Himalayas etc you know the Indus valley I mean the the region is connected climate crisis is going to be exacerbated unless we figure out ways to realize you know how we need to build from the community across these large swaths of eco and social systems uh in order to survive so i i mean i think the idea of 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 building local is really important but the critique and the the understanding that you have to work across um communities is essential and that's why i i i brought up the the dangers of ethno nationalism you know where we see caste and class and community and religion as borders as obstacles as enemies when we're not going to survive climate crisis we're not going to survive this pandemic and we're not going to survive this economic crisis without realizing that that we find we need to be uh, you know more find solidarity amongst ourselves so rather than the self sufficient village self sufficient planet thank you uh Sidesh Hello 
You were saying something, Michael? I saw Malesha's hand go up. Okay. Uh, so moving which, on. By, which, by the way, half of what I just said is because of Malesha's uh, expertise okay. <laughs> on ecosystems in Bangalore. Malik, you want to say something? There are several hands uh, raised. Yeah, I would request everybody to kindly key in the questions because there are a lot of questions already out there. So can we move uh, accordingly, please? So why we get back to uh, those who have raised their hands, I'll just quickly take a couple of questions that are already here. Uh, Sydney Luckett has uh, made an interesting comment, which I also observed. You actually said, kick the habit of growth for growth's sake. We don't need McKinsey consultants. And he says exactly the same thing. To kick the habit of growth, we need to kick the GDP as a measure of well-being of the economy. So would you like to say a little more on that? How do we do it? Yeah. Isn't it funny? You know, most, most of us, most people don't even know what GDP is, but we're still controlled by it, you know. Uh, and it makes it makes absolutely no sense. Um, and so I really appreciate the question and comment. I mean, th this is the idea uh, of, of degrowth. It doesn't mean tighten your belt. It doesn't mean you who live on a couple dollars a day, you have to live on less. Not at all. It's it's a critique of the uh, of, of global capitalism. It's a it's a, it's a critique of the mantra that we need to grow. You know. At, I mean, it's, it's common for a U.S. president, whenever there's a crisis, to say, get back in the market and consume because your consumption will revitalize the economy. But it's our consumption that's creating debt and creating, you know, uh, deforestation, etc. We, we should be able to consume what is, what is good, what is necessary, what is regional, right? We, we need to, like, stop subsidizing these industries that make it affordable for us to get cheap products from China or from the United States or what have you, uh, that's the paradigm that we need to, to destroy. I mean, GDP is symbolic, right? That we just, you know, India has to be at 7% growth or you're not, or you're not going to win the prime ministry position, you know? <laughs> kind of get out of that mode because people are still poor. People are getting poor. The, 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 question, is, uh, the question is, how do you get off this train of growth and think what matters, you know? When we think of housing, food, healthcare, these are the things that the pandemic is making crystal clear that we lack. Uh, if you build healthcare on a model of caring, all of a sudden you have nurses and primary healthcare workers and what have you who are paid well, who don't have to, in our case, work at three nursing homes in order to just pay their bills. So, you know, growth, not in the sense of tightening your belt, but growth in the sense of a fundamental critique of the, the engine of capitalism. It, because implicit in that term growth is also expropriation. It's land grabbing, right? It's kicking people off their land. It's not just more stuff. As I was trying to quickly describe in my, in my talk, that, that the only way that these uh, global firms can create these global supply chains is if they destroy the local, right? So, Implicit in that is the growth, but it's, it's really about expropriation, exploitation, unnecessary production. Most of the economy in the US, most corporate profits in the United States are in Wall Street, finance. And finance, by, by definition, by business strategy, uh, is, is, uh, cuts employment. There's no job creation in, in finance. So anytime you bring in a private equity firm, you can be guaranteed that the first move is to destroy jobs. So, so that kind, that, all of that fits into this kind of uh, icon of growth and GDP that we need to de-link from. Thank you. So Sydney uh, later on says that uh, Robert Kennedy pointed out that GDP does not measure all that is uh, valuable to us. Uh, and then we have Shobhan Wall, who says, I think New Zealand has implemented this, no longer using GDP as a method of evaluating wealth. And she's also provided a link to a, a paper from New Scientists. Mm. Uh, then we have a question from Les uh, Levito. Uh, 
He says, you mentioned the grassroots mutual networks which have been arising in the U.S. in response to the COVID crisis and perhaps in various ways all over the world. They started by helping the most vulnerable people and then perhaps developed a greater ambition. How can these networks mobilize to set political agendas? Yeah, good question. Well, perhaps different than in England and, and elsewhere in the United States, uh, they've become more uh, prominent recently. And um, they're basically starting in poor African-American communities and that have been completely, uh, you know, set apart from the economy. That is, that they have no access to banks, no access to credit. They're constantly harassed by the police and, and the debt police. You know, the whole Black Lives Matter uh, movement started basically because African Americans were arrested for some minor infraction, like, uh, you know, a broken tail, tail light on their car. And because they collect so many of those and those, those, those fines are so expensive, they would go to jail. And so the Black Lives Matter movement started as a critique of the harassment that the state and, you know, um, and, and the local industries were perpetrating amongst its people and realized that there's no hope unless they created, well, what became this national movement, but also creating mutual aid societies. So throughout the South, the American South, there are propping up these mutual aid uh, communities. Uh, of course, they want to link up with each other because solidarity in numbers, you know, learning from each other. Um, a long time ago in the 1980s, uh, we had, a, we, it was, what was very prominent were small uh, savings and loans, small banks that existed in communities all across the country that some were nonprofit, some were for-profit that could only use that money to build or to invest in the locally. And at the same, would only, could only take money from the community. I mean, not to romanticize a for-profit banking system, but that was completely destroyed by, uh, you know, in the 1980s by Wall Street firms, completely removed from the landscape. So now all we have are huge banks, which basically don't allow most people to access it. So out of necessity, mutual aid societies have been created. And interesting enough, some of that has percolated up to the state level. And I'll just give one example. There's a, a fairly poor state next to us, uh, North Dakota, that created a nonprofit state level banking system, realizing that the corporate banks weren't even interested in, that, in their people. You know, I mean, it was middle class people and poor people were realizing that the banks weren't interested. So less, it's a little different than in, in England and the history is not as long, but it's, it's becoming, um, really um, significant now in, this, in some of the poorest communities and the communities of people, including former engineers, people who were laid off in the last economic crisis uh, that, you know, that, that we need to go local in terms of this kind of organizing. Thank you. We have a, another interesting question from Raghu Casey. So he says that it appears that the World Economic Forum and Co has prepared for the post industrial economy, digital, artificial intelligence, automation, remote work, school art, cinema, social distance, the pretext, mysterious virus, the enemy, depopulation, strategy with bio RFID and surveillance, digital, biological capitalism. Is this not a fundamental shift? And how do, how do we build movements to fight for our fundamental biological rights? Any pointers to the movements on these lines globally and locally? Yeah, wow. Uh, that's a big question. That's a nice question. Um, I don't have an answer. I'd like to hear yours. But, um, you know, on, on just like on a superficial level uh, or the a starting point, you know, I, I, I don't have much access. I don't have much interest in a lot of the um, technology uh, that my children uh, are invested in. <laughs> But, you know, 99% of this kind of social media communication only exists today because of advertising, right? So however fancy, you know, we, maybe my people, you know, my generation think that all this kind of technological innovation that's happening from Silicon Valley, from Bangalore and what have you, that is making billions of dollars for investors, uh, that is selling consumer goods left and right that become obsolete immediately, um, that 
most of it hinges on the same thing that we just talked about, growth and consumption. The advertisers would not be there, which would not pr promote the creation, the desire to have all this data. Because essentially, a lot of what you described is about this voracious demand for this thing called big data. Most people, including corporations, have no idea what's inside big data, but the extent to which we can give up as individuals data that can become part of a big data, then one imagines, and Google and Amazon have already taken advantage of it, it becomes a source of wealth. But that source of wealth is only valuable if someone else will buy it, or if advertising can be the vehicle in which that big data can, uh, can be uh, utilized. So again, it goes back to this question of growth and the question of uh, kind of consumer-driven capitalism, corporate capitalism that creates the, the needs and desires that we have um, and, and, and facilitated by this, this, this new technology. It goes down, it, it all reduces to the most banal kind of crude form of small data collection that we allow happening. So of course, what's its vulnerability? on two fronts. We can stop giving it. Hopefully this, this Zoom data is not being collected and being uh, commodified in some way by some corporation. In fact, investors are pulling out of the company Zoom because Zoom has clearly not figured out a way to tap its data and make maximum profit. It's kind of ironic, right? Everybody's on Zoom, but the investors are pulling out. But, but so the one thing is, is we as individuals can stop giving our data but secondly, more on the structural level, is that we can just stop buying. And I mean, you know, the, the, without us buying, there's no advertising. Without advertising, there's no need to tap into all that bio data that it's trying to collect from my body and from our minds and what have you. I mean, maybe I'm being simplistic. Certainly, I'm not suggesting that there's certain kind of technological innovation that's not useful to keep people alive, you know, in the, in the healthcare industry, uh, or in maybe traffic monitoring and what have you. But, but most of the, the companies that are in that business are driven by the more global capital kind of profit making, which I described in terms of our healthcare systems and our food systems. And now big data and IT is just mimicking that. So what's, what's really important to appreciate that in the city of Bangalore, IT jobs are becoming scarce or scarcer. Why? because they're automatizing that process that they used to work hard and get paid well for. And through that automization, it, 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 it defers or it allows for the cloud, which are basically five companies, right? Uh, Microsoft, Apple, Google, Amazon, uh, who control the cloud to take advantage of the skills of the Bangalore IT profession to allow them to automatize the software which they themselves used to produce and manage. So you could see that it's a, it's, a, it's a no job, it's a jobless growth kind of enterprise, big data. So the sooner that we get off it and, and figure out how we can use this kind of innovation for our, our needs, right? Uh, the more, the way in which we can, in a sense, tame it. It might become deglobalized, right? That is, how can IT be used for the needs of Bangalore? I remember 10 years ago when I first started doing research in Bangalore, I, I started off by interviewing IT managers. And the first question I asked, because I was interested in the way the city was growing so fast and the role of IT, and, I, and every manager I spoke to said, uh, you know, Bangalore is not our customer. We're, we're, we don't produce these goods in order to, to, to sell in rupees. We produce these goods to sell in dollars. So we are based in Bangalore, but we do not provide for Bangalore. And so in a sense, what they do is they buy land, right? And they, they obviously offer uh, professional class jobs, but, but, but the pivot is, and, and the shareholders are demanding that they, they, they go global. And ironically, going global in the big data industry is mean being part of the, the monopoly uh, industry of the, the five biggest companies, which will inevitably sacrifice a lot of the local production in Bangalore. So it's not just a metaphor. Uh, it's really uh, similar to the healthcare industry and similar to the food industry that we need to be cognizant of. Aside from the, all the issues of the state and surveillance and, you know, taking our data for surveillance purposes, which is a whole nother kind of realm, which they could not do, the state could not do 
if global capital is not investing in it, right? So that's important to appreciate. And for my opinion, at least. Thank you. So we have a question from uh, Janardana GL, and he says, uh, Dear Goldman, the corporates from USA and Japan planning to shift their companies to India. If it happened, Indian natural resources is in danger zone. How can we stop this? <laughs> You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Uh, that's the right way to think about it. Don't just think about, oh yeah, more jobs, just what we need, but more natural resource extraction. I mean, obviously it's a little more complicated than that. But, um, but you know, the question is, you know, what are they producing and what are they selling? I, I spent some time up at the aerospace park in uh, North Bangalore. I don't know if this question is coming from Bangalore, but um, a lot of thousands of acres of farmland were taken in order to produce, um, you know, cutting edge 21st century aerospace park, which all the major industries would come, you know, and then uh, produce. So manufacturing made in India. But, but uh, you know, when we visited sites, like one site in particular, um, they, they were basically producing a small switch, which goes in a Boeing airplane uh, doors, right? A switch about this big. And the engineer explained to me that this farmland went to this, this factory. That base, and, I, and I said, how did it work? He said, well, basically we get all the small parts are flown in from New York City the workers that come from north, northern India put together this tiny switch. It gets back on a plane and gets sent back to New York City and then to, and then to Seattle to Boeing. I don't know, is that progress? Is that development? Or is that natural resource extraction? <laughs> you know, it sounds 21st century, an aerospace park, but the practicalities is global capital does not come to India to just tap the greatest minds, right? It's also trying to create a global supply chain. And sometimes it's, it's beneficial for locals and sometimes it's not. In this case, I wonder, uh, was it worth sacrificing the lives of farmers and the, the accessible local good food to produce a widget that is, has no value to, to local people? And in fact, as soon as uh, the workers demand more, more money or as soon as the city demands taxes because it's all tax free, they'll just get up and move to the Philippines, right? or to Bangladesh, or maybe back to the United States where, where, where a lot of the companies from India are returning. It's, it's a no-win situation. And in terms of climate crisis, the fact that that little switch can be produced in Bangalore tells you how much subsidies are going to the shipping industry, the airline industry, and the fossil fuel industry to make that little switch affordable to produce across the world. Uh, thank so you, Mike. Faith. Thank you. Uh, I saw Subrat's hand go up. Subrat, would you like to ask your question? Subrat, did you hear me? Okay. Uh, I would request uh, Prakash Kashwan to uh, comment because he had a, a follow up. Uh, question requesting if he could intervene. Uh, so maybe Prakash. Hi, yeah, thanks Bhargavi. Um, Michael, thank you for your response to uh, my earlier question. Um, you know, I, I'm actually also in the US, so I wasn't quite speaking from the Indian standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, and I appreciated your response about, um, you know, working with the local government. But, you know, if we look at the, the institutional history of federalism in US, it actually emerged out of, you know, in, in, there's a political science uh, paper, uh, institutional economics paper, which um, labels the US federalism as market protecting federalism. And US federalism is by far the strongest federalism anywhere in the world to the extent I know. And mm -hmm. so I think it's, uh, you know, while we draw a lot of strength from uh, this idea that, you know, we, it, it'll have to be bottom up, um, there's that history and of course, now we also see that, you know, the localism is also producing the bigoted and the reactionary responses of uh, white supremacists. So, I mean, it, it's quite a tangle, right? So we, we have yeah. to continue to struggle with these ideas. Yeah, you're right. And, uh, and you know, the, the, the mayor's position in, in our city, count, corporator's position in Indian cities is very weak. But uh, anything's possible, right? I mean, it seems like that is a site 
of intervention. And I know Bargavi writes uh, and organizes around the, trying to empower ward committees. You know, it's a start, but once you get people together, creative minds and, you know, demanding people, uh, a lot can be accomplished. I mean, all of what you said is true. And look, I could have, I, I mean, I could have gone on in the first half of my talk about how horrific conditions are in the United States, right? <laughs> but I, I did ch ch choose at this moment, I, I'm sitting in my basement, <laughs> you know, quarantined uh, to, um, to appreciate the positive and the, po the potent see of, of, of activism, you know, because it's all, it's all around us. Uh, thank you, um, Michael. Subrat, are you still there? Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, we have a question from Manjulika and she says, uh, thank you for that white canvas you covered so well. How can the taxation system change so that what's local handmade directly from our farmers. Yeah, we have the same problem. You know, that's, that's why I gave the example of, of uh, the community uh, supported agriculture, which are basically <clears throat> farmers around my city and around many American cities uh, providing, um, you know, basically boxes of food every week, uh, which we subscribe to and become members of. Now, that is completely unsubsidized. It's completely unaffordable for, uh, you know, working class people. Um, but it's tasty, delicious, and one can believe that kind of synergy uh, that is between consumer and producer can create a politics of change. And one of the big issues is to realize that even though our governments insist on the discourse of austerity, there's never enough money. Right? We know that's false, right? And 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 the question is, where is the money going? And so. Like, like I've been uh, harping on, you know, our global food system only exists because of subsidies. There's no way that it can exist without it. So the question is, how can we delink that? Every year, Europe spends, and Europe and the United spends something like 400, 500 billion dollars subsidizing its farmers. So its wheat can go to Africa, its soy can go to Indonesia and be cheaper than the locally produced grains so that's crucial, right? Because there's a destructive develop, uh, dimension to that. The way in which our soy industry in the United States is being so subsidized that it's destroying the Indonesian soy industry, as well as just, uh, not uh, propping up, supporting local agriculture in, in my country. So we, we have to critique, you know, at all levels of the state, that kind of subsidization huge amounts of money and instead insist that it focus on local community regional based obviously <clears throat> i live in a country in a, in a city that's cold like nine months out of the year we can't grow everything but we can grow a lot and the question is how can we link up with local farmers you know i mean if you look at the, if you look at the the world bank which is which has been you know a horrible institution for the last 75 years uh they've been pushing these tax-free zones that is the aerospace park the it sector is completely tax-free when i when i ask the uh, <clears throat> the it companies uh how much they pay in taxes they say they voluntarily pay three percent right voluntarily <laughs> so so the, the point is is that there's no teeth there's no uh there, there's no commitment to the local to the regional to the national if you don't have to pay taxes as soon as you start paying taxes there's a commitment and the commitment is to regenerate what you may be taking or to give back to the community what you're taking. Without taxation, there's none of that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, taxing in all countries is regressive. That is, it's, it's taxing the consumer, it's taxing the poor, except which has a disproportionate effect on the working class and the poor. We have to tax our corporations. The problem is with global capital, as soon as you say, I'm going to tax you, they're going to leave. But maybe it's good that they leave. That's the point. Thank you. And then we can basically finance local, local community, regional-based production. And those that will come to produce will produce if they have a market. That is a market of people who need healthcare, a market of people who need food. And then it won't be, uh, you know, basically retired people from the United States flying into Bangalore to get a hip surgery because it's half the price as it is here. I mean, what does that do for the people of Bangalore? and particularly during this COVID-19 pandemic. 
Thank you. Uh, we will extend the session for another uh, 15, 20 minutes for sure, if Michael has the energy for it, because it's already 6.30 here and we still have about 60 questions more. So going on to Benny's question, uh, Benny says the last crisis in 2008 further strengthened the right and corporate power. So far with the COVID crisis, authoritarian governments have amassed further power and are responding to corporate needs. Progressive movements are weaker, not stronger, and are focused on dealing with the immediacy of the crisis. How can we ensure that this is again not a lost opportunity? Yeah, excellent question. That's exactly the premise of, of my uh, talk, which is how to take advantage. <laughs> I mean, not how to take advantage, but how to find the political potential in this terrible moment, you know? And, and, and part of that was to highlight that, uh, you know, how, how, how destructive our global supply chain systems are. Even though they're lauded at Harvard Business School, they're really, you know, in terms of the pandemic, in terms of lack of access to local healthcare and food in, my country, in this country, and probably all over the world, um, are inextricably linked. And the, the extent to which people, many, you know, people are being able to see that, articulate that, and figure out that um, our governments will become more authoritative, will become uh, more handmaidens to global capital, unless you know we protest and unless we delink. I don't have obviously I don't have a simple solution. That's why I just tried to describe some of the ongoing uh, movements and activism that's going on in this country, which is considered an extremely conservative country. You know, which is which at any given moment. I would feel is completely apathetic to political activity. Still, it is uh, thriving in, in towns, villages, in cities across this country. And I know it thrives in India. Every time I'm in, in, in India, there, every time I'm in Bangalore, there's a strike, you know, there's a protest, there's a walkout, there's a, there's a challenge, there's a movement. There are activists everywhere. And, you know, the hard part is, of course, um, cutting through traffic and organizing <laughs> and figuring out ways to, to get different communities fighting together. But um, I don't know, Benny, I'm a little more hopeful um, I, because we have to be, right? Thank you. So we have an, uh, a, a question from Alan, uh, which is, with the US manufacturing industry betting big on China's supply chain prior to COVID and now given the supply chain being severely strained, do you see the US manufacturing industry restructuring to bring it back to the US and provide a boost to the blue collar worker and probably revitalize the unions? Um, if the glass is half full, uh, yes, of course. <clears throat> I mean, you know, immediately Apple was talking about that. Uh, but you know, um, but the business model is all about cutting labor costs. It's not about um, compromising with labor, right? So that's the problem. I mean, if you take the example of Apple, one of the largest companies in the world, one of the wealthiest companies in the world, um, you know, they're sitting on, I can't remember how much, $500 billion of cash right now. Uh, even though they own stores, they basically just in time produce through leasing systems, all their production units. They don't own their factories. They don't have to, they don't, those workers are not, you know, to be paid by Apple. Uh, moreover, their headquarters are not even in Silicon Valley, right? Their headquarters are in Ireland. Why? Because they're given a tax haven. So Apple doesn't pay taxes. Apple's sitting on cash, $500 billion. Yes, right now we're not buying iPhones and iPads and stuff, but basically it's not losing any money. So the business model does work for, for these corporations. Does that make sense? Um, so there's no incentive to move back to the United States to produce, in the case of Apple. In the case of, you know, the question is, uh, in the case of the large food companies, you know, what are they losing? I'll tell you, it's the farmers that are killing their animals and, and destroying their tomatoes. It's the farmers that are losing money. It's the farmers that, are, that are, are desperately trying to get loans from the banks. 
the, I'm not so sure Cargill or Del Monte or you know Monsanto or the agro uh, you know ConAgra are losing money right now. You know ConAgra, which is in the global uh, food system, makes most of its money from commodity trading, not from production of food. It's moved that far away, and what that means is they can profit even when the farmer uh, isn't producing. I know it does not make sense, but at Harvard Business School, it makes a lot of sense. And the point is that lot, our largest companies are running based on that logic. That is that they, they lose little during a crisis. And that's why the stock market in the United States is right now soaring. Well, there's no incentive to come back and pay, pay lay blue collar workers more so that they can become part of a union and demand access to X and Y. So we have to organize. You know, what can we produce? And I don't mean we, you know, I can't produce anything, but we in terms of, you know, the people who work in those factories who could turn around and figure out ways to produce what's needed, you know. You, I can't, you, I, I don't know where you're based, but right now, throughout the world, people are producing masks, people are, are inventing ventilators, people are creating, you know, the things that global capital refuses to produce because it's not profitable. And I think these are lessons that, that can really fuel a lot of exciting uh, movements. Thank you, Michael. I saw Sujit's hand go up. Uh, Sujit Patwardhan, uh, can you please ask your question? Uh, no, I wasn't raising my hand. I merely said that there are some hands raised and they have not been asked so far. Our oh. colleague Vinay is, uh, no, um, our colleague from Pune, he's got his Vikas, he's got his hand up. So that's yeah. all I was saying. I, I've been listening. It is very interesting. I have no immediate questions. I'm sure I'll send something to Michael on an email. Sometime. Thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. Right now, I, have, I won't take up your time. Just okay. ask. I, I also saw Leo's message saying he wanted to build on a, a previous question. So, Leo, would you like to say what you wanted to say? Can I interrupt? This has been the longest uh, time that Leo has been on mute that I've ever heard. Yeah. <laughs> I agree with that. You broke the record, Leo. <laughs> well, Sujit. <laughs> Leo, go ahead. Yeah, you know, who's, who is that I do get the sense of you know, uh, the tension that is being built between a world which is being centralized, uh, taking advantage of a pandemic or a climate crisis and the roles of international agencies, including the United Nations, World Bank, and et cetera, et cetera, uh, actually feeding the centralization movement. And here we are talking about the importance of saving this world by an amazingly revolutionary decentralized movement. But we have this paradox of using technology, uh, which is, you know, designed to be operating in a decentralized way, but as just now you said, Michael, that it is so acutely centralized by four or five companies. So the, the majority of human population is caught in this paradox of trying to liberate the human spirit from this enormous machine, uh, which is financialized. So I just wanted to say that, I mean, you're uh, talk brings about so many uh, uh, contradictions and puts it on the desk and uh, says, let's deal with it. Uh, my worry is, uh, and I'm not trying to be cynical or negative, but I'm, my worry is that are people only seeing the local for being in the local or ah. seeing the local as a very phenomenal, powerful instrument uh, for global change? Yeah. No, excellent point, Leo, uh, and that is really what I, I, I want to highlight is that there is no local without the regional and the global. You know, it's a relational dynamic. Literally, the idea of the local can only exist if you have the non-local, right? <laughs> um, city and countryside, etc. So I think it's really important to, to realize that if we're, we, if we're just fighting for de-linking, de you know, local self-sufficient, then it's just communalism, you know, then, it, then it's just, uh, well, then it's a pipe dream. You know, we all are interdependent and climate crisis uh, has hopefully taught us that. So we, we have to think across scale, but you also have to organize 
right now, immediately, how do we provide healthcare and income to people in our community? And from there, we need to think, okay, let's just bring back business as usual. No, right? So what is the new type of business, which is, which is the business of caring? And, and investors do not want to invest in caring. And so that's critical. But that, that goes across scale. And I, 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 I absolutely agree, Leo, that there is no local in that sense, and nor should we romanticize that we will only work in the local, you know. Uh, we have a from Hari, and he says, uh, under the SDGs, we have a whole bunch of new indicators. Could some of these perhaps weighted like the gross national happiness of Bhutan provide more meaningful indicators of progress as a society. Your thoughts on applying quantitative tracking in a caring uh, econ uh, degrowth economy? Uh, wow. Well, uh, that's a good question, but that's, that's uh, out of my toolkit. Um, I spend too much time critiquing uh, global statistics, <laughs> so I don't know how to create them. But, but there, there are some wonderful e ecological economists that you may know of, uh, Giorgios Kallis, K-A-L-L-I-S, uh, based in Barcelona. Actually, there's a whole team of people from all over Europe who are based in Barcelona who work in this area of degrowth. Um, ecological economists, and, and they've been hard at work doing what you're asking for. But mo and, and, and you can get, by the way, online, a PDF, a lot of their books on degrowth. Um, but they do try to move away from that, 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 um, that goal of quantifying human value because they see it's a slippery slope, right? And I, 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 I'd like to talk another time with you about how, you know, what we could see. I mean, I think the Bhutan idea of happiness is great, but um, that means that there's such a deficit of happiness right now. I'm not so sure I want to want to spend my time measuring it, but we definitely do want to suggest that that the, that, that rather than indicators, you know, the, the social relations that we're focusing on. It's a process. It's not a product. It's not a a particular goal. It's a generalizable, you know, set of practices that that you know you all decide what is what is important. You know, if you live along a, a river, it's different than if you live in the mountains. If you live in a in a you know grain belt, it's different again, and uh, and so I, I just I guess I, I I defer to the qualitative and the relational rather than the more positivist uh, quantitative. But I'm I'm open to any kind of alternative to GDP that you you have. Uh, thank you. So we have a question from Maria Adriani. What if the pandemic is not collapsing global economy, but actually the other way around? In Yogyakarta, many locals who at first not consumed to the globalization, at least in the thoughts and communication slash media, suddenly become. Be become because what? Because they're, they're, they're reading the global news or what? Um, Maria, would you like to complete your question? Okay, I think I think we'll move on. Well, so, well I, I I mean, I, I, one aspect of that that is, that is really important is that the pandemic is the the viral pandemic, the COVID nineteen is not going to go away soon. I mean, I don't know anything, but. We're all epidemiologists now, right? <laughs> um, but, but I think uh, all the epidemiologists are saying unequivocally, it's gonna go on for a long time. And, and right, you know, even if some company comes up with a vaccine, who can afford it, right? How can it be distributed? Uh, I'm very uh, wary of this idea that it's gonna, it's gonna disappear soon. So then the, the, the fear is, and I don't know if this is Maria's question, but the fear is, is that we have to just, live with it and die with it and 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 pick up where we left off and i think what we have to do is say we cannot have business as usual normality is has to be not only a trenchant critique of what caused this virus but also a reinvention of society even with the virus you know um and i, I because i don't really know the, the the full question i think that's i'll just stop right there yeah so uh, in the context of business not um, being as usual, 
we have somewhat a related question. What are the, uh, this is from Bhakti Pawar, who says, what are the major five key areas you would suggest countries should focus on to overcome economic imbalance occurred due to COVID-19? Uh -huh. Well, good question. Well, I think uh, let's just go from the talk that, uh, that you know, food, healthcare, housing, and income, right? Um, that's, that's four. There was a fifth in there somewhere. I don't know. Happiness. Um, uh, you know, it, it, the question is, you know, what are the needs? Uh, in, in Los Angeles, there are something like 100,000 homeless people. So that's very different than whatever small city you may come from, you know. Uh, so homelessness is a serious pandemic in Los Angeles, and it has to be dealt with. So if I were living in Los Angeles, that's where we would focus. And then the question becomes, how do we create decommodified housing for these people, right? And then, then it becomes, then it snowballs into these other issues, right? Because people can't live in housing unless they have some sort of, ability to buy food, right? And to have access to healthcare. A lot of people are sick who live on the streets, of course. So it, 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 it snowballs. And I think the extent to which healthcare, food, housing becomes decommodified, that is that it is freely accessible, it's universal, uh, is, you know, obviously a radical critique of our, <laughs> of our current system and a point of building up a really, you know, obviously healthy society that will not promote and can perpetuate global climate crisis, you know, as well as gross inequalities. Um, and, and in Los Angeles, like in any city in the world, there's huge plots of land that are unbuilt, that are speculated on. Cities own, my university owns huge plots of land that remain empty, you know. They're always interested in solving the world's problems. We're trying to push them to to build housing or to have housing be built for the homeless in, my, in our city. What more can we do for the benefit of the city, the country, the world than to offer housing, healthcare, and food? You know, community gardens, community health cares, and community schools are, uh, uh, are the, the essence of this kind of uh, new caring society. And it's not so new, right? I mean, we all know it's intuitively in our, in our desires and our thoughts and our imaginations that, oh yeah, that's how it should be. It never is, right? The schools are always failing us. The food is always failing us. The healthcare is, of course, failing us. But we have it in our in our minds that this is how it should work. So that's that's where I would start, if you will. Uh, thank you, Michael. I saw Vikas's hand up. Uh, Vikas, would you like to ask your question? Or uh, probably Vikas is left. Uh, okay, uh, Suprabha, are you still here? I, I know you had a question. You have to unmute. Unmute. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm in lockdown in Bangalore. I live in Kerala uh, by the forest, actually. And I've been really concerned about the migrant workers. Uh, there was a point that you said in your um, talk that really interested me, which is why don't we ask them what they want? And um, that would be a very decent thing to do in this crazy, you know, this crazy nation state that we're in. But my, my question comes from a different place, which is that many of them are actually from rural areas. Many of them have left their farms or their forests or fields to actually come into, you know, to do labor, all kinds of labor in the cities. And I have been following as an environmentalist, I'm an environmentalist, that the most vulnerable people today are actually the urban poor. The rural rich have anyway lots of land, the urban rich anyway can go to Mars. The rural poor have access to some kind of resource, or some kind of land or river or something. But the urban poor are the most vulnerable in any crisis. They are trapped. They trap their water supplies, their food supplies, the police, the everything. They're actually trapped. And so I'm concerned about the disemboweling of 
the so-called rural hinterland, which is actually the place where all resources come from, human and otherwise, into the city, and the disconnect that completely, you know, hides the fact that, you know, we're on a, actually on a precipice. So I, I've been imagining all these people stuck in, you know, yards and, and uh, compounds and on the road and so on, that these are the people with the real skills for themselves. They can all grow food, I'm sure. Yeah. They all have all the skills that they need to build their own houses. Yeah. They, you know, they need a bit of support and they need the time and the space, but these are the people that urban India, the rich are dependent on, and they are the ones who actually can hold the gun to our heads because they know everything. They know how to build, they know how to grow food, they know how to craft, they know how to fix, they know how to clean, they know everything. So, the, so my question has been this removal of people from the land base to the urban centers has trapped them and yet they have the skills that everybody needs today to survive climate catastrophe, economic collapse, uh, COVID, everything. So it's, it's more of a comment, but this is what I've been thinking about. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and, you know, if we, and that's the key, right? I mean, that knowledge, that knowledge is vast, but instead we, we kick these people off their land, you know, and we make them do subservient work and they get paid nothing. And in fact, what many of them, you know, that we, people who do research of that in the cities, are basically just paying off a debt that their families have, a rural debt, right? So they're, they're building the skyscrapers in your cities and they live on site and their children, their wives, and they're, 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 they have the bare minimum. And, uh, and all they're doing is paying off debt. They're not like advancing, right? They're not like moving to the city to progress and to earn money and et cetera. So that's the, the horrific contradiction. So then the question is, well, why are they being why are they so far into debt, you know, which is a, which is a big complicated question. Many reasons, the power of landlords, right? But also the, the power of corporate agriculture and the power of corporate logging and the power of corporate mining and the power of uh, corporate shipping. All those things depend upon cheap, the, the rural being basically given to them by the, the state, right? Or being able to grab it. And so they become the waste of that efficient system that can only be profitable if those, if those rural people get shoved off, if they lose their land, if they fall into debt. That's when the companies can start making money. If they actually had to pay farmers the true urban value of their land, <laughs> there would be no more urban real estate. You know, I mean, a speculation, right? That's, so, the, you know, the, there are simple, uh, it's not simple, but it's a kind of obvious thing that farmers have told me. You know, I would be rich and not poor if they had just given me the money that they have now valued my land. Instead, they give a, so the, the, in, in the case of India, but all over the world, we actively disinvest in the countryside as a way to create value in the city. Wealth, by that simple move of the government insisting that rural land is cheap, it makes it possible for speculators to make huge sums of money off urban land and that makes human beings cheap, right? All that knowledge, in a sense, sure, they become, you know, brilliant in the, in, the, in the art of architecture and construction. I mean, to think that these rural folks are building skyscrapers is quite amazing. So why do we pay them so little, you know? If we pay them a, a wage that deserves the, the making of these buildings, then the speculation would stop because they only make money because the land is cheap and the labor is cheap and the resources are cheap, fossil fuels, cement, etc. As soon as we put a real price on it, the one you're, you're suggesting, based on that expertise and skill, it would stop. So it, what, what it, it's not a, a calculation, it's a political movement, right? And it's just sad. It's just sad. I mean, I met a lot of 15, 17, 18 year old boys who were given away, you know, to work in these construction sites because their families were so far in debt. And you know, there's no hope. You know, what I learned was that people in North Bangalore, the farmers that were kicked off their land, refused to work on the production of these buildings because they, would, they knew that they would just be slaves, you know? 
that the, the wages that were paid on that farmland to build that aerospace park was so low that even the farmers that were kicked off the land couldn't afford to work there. So you know there's exploitation of the worst kind, but it's only because we all decide that urban real estate and speculation is, is necessary for growth, for progress, for our investment. You know, even IT workers whose salaries have not been rising realize that their best hope is to invest in condom in housing, right? And that just continually feeds the loop. So I, I think you you know you said it better than I. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And on that note, uh, thank you everybody. I'm really sorry because we've had like hundreds of questions, both on private chat, on chat that everybody can see, WhatsApp messages. I have definitely not done justice to all the questions. Uh, please forgive, this is shortage of time, but thank you, Michael, for that brilliant and really awakening talk. Uh, I think Leo wants to have a, a closing comment, so over to Leo. Yes, uh, Michael, I'm sorry we couldn't get across to you uh, Fisher Coffee from Bangalore. We'll try it next time. Uh, but thank you for an amazing talk and, uh, you know, really staying on for one and a half hours. Uh, I mean, last three hours of sleep and taking all the questions very, very patiently. Uh, so really big, uh, big hand of applause, which we can't give this way, but, uh, you know, you, you, you hear it, I'm sure. Uh, about next week's talk, it's by Andy Sterling. Uh, he's from the University of Sussex, uh, uh, a unit called SCREW, uh, Social Policy Research Institute uni uh, unit. And uh, he's going to speak about uh, modernity without its clothes. The pandemic crisis shines a light on futilities of control. Some of the themes that you picked up, Michael, will be built on by uh, uh, Andy next week, and I invite everyone who stayed on. Uh, today we had about 150 people in the room, uh, and uh, please spread the word around about the next talk. And uh, those who have stayed on after one and a half, two hours of this, uh, thank you uh, for your patience as well. Uh, I, and the week after that uh, would be a brilliant essay. Uh, uh, it's uh, called, What if Humans are the Virus Destroying the Earth? and COVID is Earth's vaccine. Actually, that's a cartoon we use, but the topic was, uh, the theme of his essay was, the COVID pandemic, seven lessons to be learned for a future. So that would be play mode follow Andy next week. So hey, can yeah, I just, thank I you just all thank for uh, joining us. Uh, Thanks, everyone. You've given me a lot of, a lot of suspense, a lot of energy. I hope, uh, Michael, we go next week will to be available like the other first two. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Please. Because many of my friends, uh, I don't, didn't see they were able to turn. Go ahead, send the invitation to them. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Hey, thanks, everyone. Thanks, uh, Leo, Bhargavi, everyone around the world. Uh, and Michael, a request. I know you read out from your notes or text, whatever. If you share your text, we'll also put it up on our website. Uh, so that can be some, you know, something to read now. Sure. Uh, yeah. Right. So the ESG website will have all the talks and reports about these talks. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I thank everyone who supported us. Uh, Joe from CFA, our team members. Uh, Sana in particular and Bhargavi and uh, Vindya, not the Bhargavi who coordinated, but uh, Bhargavi, there's another Bhargavi here and uh, Vindya who actually tweeted, please go to the ESG handle uh, on Twitter. And I just saw that tweets about and Shrestha who backed her up and uh, Varun who has been working on the background. Yeah, thank you very much everyone. Thanks, everyone.